Another sip of tea before I go in. Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly Q&A tech session. You ask the questions, we give you the answers. Get involved, use that hashtag, Ask GMBN Tech, right underneath there in the comments, and we'll get going. So first up, this one's actually quite cool. So I've been posting a lot of pictures of linkage forks, and this is from Richie Rowland. Hey mate, so we've both ridden AMP linkage forks back in the day, but have you ridden any of the new breed of multi-link forks hitting the market now? Uh, what are your thoughts on them? And what are your thoughts on how those pivots will cope with UK conditions? Cheers, Richie. Okay, so uh, Richie is essentially talking about the Trust Fork and some of the more recent forks that you might have seen out there on the market. So there's a Motion Fork as well, of course. Um, let's skip back to the beginning for a minute. So first up, there was the Amp Fork. So this is a really old school dated fork. It's one of my own actual forks off a bike that I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is what Richie was talking about. Now these were famous for actually getting loose, needing a lot of work, the damper leaked oil and all that sort of stuff, despite the fact that they worked really quite well. But a lot of people couldn't overcome the fact that they needed so much work to keep them working like that. And of course there were other slight hindrances to them, like mud clearance, and of course the fact if you ride in the UK or Europe or Pacific Northwest or wherever in particular that's quite muddy, then you're gonna wear out pivot points quite a lot. So let's just go for a list of some of these early ones. So here's the amp on the screen again. Now there's also the Gervin fork. Now look at this beast. So this was more like a twin crown style fork. Uh, axle moved in a J path. The earlier ones had, as far as I know, had an elastomer rubber, which acted sort of as a friction damper as well as the spring. Uh, the later ones had a no lean shock in them. I'm sure there was some in the middle, but I forget the orientation of those. There was also the Quasar fork. Uh, that was a UK born version of a very similar looking fork, similar sort of concept. Then of course there was the Larwell leader fork. Uh, now this fork was quite revolutionary. All right, get apart from the looks, apparently, I never rode this one, apparently these were really, really quite good. Uh, they used a proper shock absorber at the top and it had linkage, uh, linkage design of course, and it had full bearings on them. Then skip forward a few years, quite a few years, to this carbon fiber beast. It uses carbon fiber leaf springs that are rumored to be made from the same carbon fiber used in tanks. Uh, I actually love this fork. It looks odd, and I know that people give it a hard time, but I had one on a gravel bike that I borrowed from uh, Robert Nukeproof, and I rode it all winter a couple of years back, and I loved it. I thought it was phenomenal. Um, it didn't really feel like a suspension fork, but it definitely reduced the buzz. It didn't really give me any more grip, but it definitely gave me more comfort, which on a bike like that is exactly what you need, to be honest. But that was a trailing link design. And the other fork, of course, with the trailing link design that people know is the Trust fork. So they've got two, they've got the message and they've got the shout. Now, you cannot compare these to a telescopic fork. In fact, you can't compare any of these forks really to a telescopic fork, so they'll work differently. Uh, but the Trust in particular, I mean, they're full sealed bearings everywhere. Um, I have no issues with the long-term durability of these forks. I've not ridden the shout quite as much, but I've had the message on my bike now for probably knocking on near enough a year. Um, you know, on and off, it's been ridden on various different terrains. It's not been treated particularly well. The biggest thing I didn't get on with, actually, to be honest, on that fork was the fact I couldn't put a mudguard on it. That's a huge problem here in the UK. You might laugh at me, but uh, trying to ride in our horrible, wet, crappy conditions without getting a face full of mud and uh, ruining your vision, bit of a problem. That aside, though, I've really learned to quite like that fork. There's certain things I don't think it does very well, and there's certain things that I don't like the way it handles, but the way I ride the bike it's on, it's on my Canyon Neuron, this is it on the screen. It it works great, it makes the bike feel a bit longer, that, and of course the effect of that is the fact that you don't, um, you don't increase your head angle, you don't sort of decrease um, your trail, all that sort of stuff, it actually increases, so the bike gets more stable as it compresses as opposed to less stable. It's a real odd thing. For the record, Richie, I really love the way that fork works but I'm not sure a lot of people, A, are gonna get over how it looks, and B, realistically, are gonna, excuse the pun, fork out nearly 2,000 pounds or $2,000 on a fork like that. I think it's a little bit of an issue. Like the fork, though, is fantastic, and the work that's gone into it, it's a linkage design. We've got linkage designs to the back end on most of the really successful bikes out there. Granted, I know that there's a lot of single pivots, but a lot of the really good single pivots these days are single pivots with a linkage to activate the shock. This is a linkage fork. Why are we not looking at linkage forks? 
I think linkage forks could well be the future for mountain biking, but we're not gonna know at this stage because we're just not gonna see enough people running them, I don't think. Um, well, there you go, there's my little bit. Um, if anyone else got any comments on them, I'd love to know, let us know. Next up is from CR51 Gore. Can you get fatter grips? All I can find are different compounds of rubber. I've got quite big hands. Uh, yeah, there's loads of different options on the market. Um, we run Ergon grips here at GMBN and GMBN Tech. They make all of their grips in two different sizes, thin and thick, or thin and thinner, whichever way you want to put it. Um, the thicker ones, they would definitely suit bigger hands like yours. Uh, there's also the DMI Death Grip. This is those on, on screen. They're available in two different sizes as well. And let's not forget, of course, the ODI Rogue. Uh, this is one of their bigger handlebar grips. ODI don't necessarily sell grips in different sizes, they just have different grips that are different sizes. You have a thinner grip or a thicker grip. The Rogue is that grip if you've got big hands. Got a lot of friends who've got big hands that love to use them. So um, plenty of options out there. I'm sure there's a lot more. If anyone can think of any, let us know in those comments. But don't forget, there is no one grip for any one rider. They're all different rubber compounds. They've all got different feels. Some are longer, some are thinner, some have got flanges, some are mushrooms, etc. There's loads of different patterns out there. Once you find what you what works for you, you'll pretty much stick with that grip. So um, good luck, and I hope you find the one that works. Okay, over to Rupert 1358. Right, got my brakes, bled, and my new hoses at the local bike shop. Then I went to Revolution Bike Park. Halfway through the day, the back brake started pulling to the grip and I started experiencing a pump up. The front brake stays fine, however. Um, well, I'm just gonna jump in there. If you're running a bike park, even though the rules, no rules, but generally in mountain biking off-road, you're gonna use your front brake more as a speed control measure, but bike parks are different because of the way you ride. Because the terrain enables you to ride a lot quicker, you tend to run on that back brake. You see this a lot with people at Whistler uh, and any sort of European bike parks. You can look at it because their rear discs always look glazed compared to the front discs. It's because they're running that back brake. Um, so your back brake's always gonna get harder work. And bear in mind, it's always gonna be harder to bleed because there's a lot more hose than the front one. You're always gonna get a less consistent bleed, however good the person is that's bleeding it. Um, I've then got, a new set of levers and calipers after this, put them on, had them bled with new hoses at the local bike shop, go to revs, same thing happened, and within one ride of being bled, I've been left with the spongy pumping up and coming to the grip, twice. I don't wanna get this after every ride, why is it happening? Okay, so like I said, the first thing, your back brake is always gonna be harder to bleed than the front brake, purely because there's sheer amount of fluid that's in there, and the fact there's more nooks and stuff for air to hide in. If there's any air in there, you're gonna get inconsistency in your braking. Now, of course, there are other things. You could have a leak. There could be a tiny crimp in the hose somewhere. The fact it's happened twice, that suggests it's fairly unlikely. But you could have a leak at the banjo, for example, which is on the caliper itself, the joint there. And we're talking like a microscopic leak, the teeniest bit that comes out. That means air can get in. And the fact that fluid is draining out also means you're gonna get a similar effect, uh, neither of which is what you're looking for. Now, you can just have a bad bleed as well. It's very easy to do a bad bleed. So however good you are and how many of your times you have done a bleed, you can still do a dodgy bleed. I've done plenty over the years where you've like, you think you've done it correct every time. You go and feel it, go for a ride, and it's not quite right, and you've got to do it again. If that's the case, especially the back brake, um, a good little hack is to have your back, uh, basically have your bike up on the back wheel, so sitting upright, have your lever horizontal, and basically have the bleed screw open at the top. Now, if there's any air in the system, it's gonna find its way to top. We're talking like an overnight job here. But of course, do not touch that lever, do not touch the bike without putting it back on and checking the bleed on it. Obviously, you'll lose fluid if you do that, and you obviously risk the fluid going near your back brake, obviously, which is at the back of the bike, underneath where the drips could go. So you have to be careful with that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know, there's also taking into account as well, certain brakes from certain manufacturers, this has happened with SRAM, it's happened with Avid, it's happened with um, Shimano, it's happened with Magura, they've all done it over the years, that you're gonna get one batch that comes out of the factory and there was something wrong. Maybe there wasn't the correct amount of grease applied on the actual pistons, perhaps the machine was faulty that day. It happens in manufacturing and it's something that, you know, people will attack a bike brand for this. Don't, take it easy, it happens in anything in life. You go to Ikea and buy shelves, you might get a dodgy one at some point. You go and buy a car for Land Rover, it might break down. You're gonna get dodgy stuff when you buy stuff. You know, just look at the numbers and the volumes that are produced, fair enough, it's really unlucky. In your case, you've had a couple, but it might just be that. You might just be really unlucky. These things do happen from time to time. Um, 
My advice would be to try and, if you don't, um, I don't want to sort of uh, undermine you, but try and learn to bleed it yourself because then you can sort of understand when those problems can arise. We've got a number of videos on the channel that will help you with doing that. And if there's anything particular I can help with, uh, let us know and I'll do my best to try and dispel the mist. But try that one, getting your bike up on the back wheel because I reckon there probably is just a bit of trapped air in there. And if you're riding at revs, it's probably a downhill bike or something like that assuming it's quite a gnarly bike park to session as a local. Um, if that's the case, you've definitely got a whole load of hose on that thing, loads of places for air pockets to hide. However good someone is at bleeding, it can still be a problem. Okay, well actually, time for a little sip of tea from uh, the late JMC. Cheers, Jace. Okay, next up is from Sekarak. Is it safe to drill my hardtails frame to make holes for internally rooted cable? Uh, no, categorically not. You're drilling a hole in something that's structural. Um, just no, don't do it. Um, I can never tell you that it's okay to do that and every bike manufacturer will tell you it's not okay to do that. That said, this is not an endorsement. I've seen people do it before and I've seen people go in through the brake, uh, bottle cage bosses even. You think the bottle cage boss, there are two holes on the frame and they put inserts in. The holes on the frame there were already there when the frame was made. They're designed to be there to house those bosses. So if you're gonna do it, maybe that's an idea, but that is not for me. I've not given you an idea of doing that. I've just told you where I've seen some people address that. And of course, the material of your frame is gonna make a significant difference here. Steel, for example, if you're gonna do it with any of them, would be a lot safer than it would, for example, drilling, alloy, or carbon. And of course, let's not forget that you're gonna instantly invalidate any warranty you might have on that bike as well, as well as sacrificing strength and probably your safety. So. Um, some people under there might tell you otherwise, but um, I would steer well clear of that. Next up is from Langleo Scar. Any ideas on how to get a cassette off without a chain whip? Back in the day, there used to be a tool called a cassette cracker um, and a hyper cracker. If I can find them, I'll put some pictures on screen, but I'm not actually sure I can even find them. I did have one back in the day, and they would use your frame to basically hold the cassette in place. It basically would fit in the end um, and wedge itself against the frame, and you literally turn the cranks around and it undoes it itself. It was a genius piece of kit. Now, I have heard of some enduro racers holding the cassette to the spokes of the bike using a spare cable. Now, that sounds like a good hack you could do. Um, I think I might actually try that. I've not tried it. I've never had a cassette that I've had to, to loosen before. I've had one I've had to tighten out on the trail. And you can do that, of course, it's just a lock ring so you can find anything to wedge in there. Use a multi-tool, a rock if you have to, to tap that thing around a couple of clicks. And basically, as soon as you get to a bike shop where anyone's gonna be able to help you, then tighten it sufficiently with the correct tool. Um, I guess your other option, if you haven't got a chain whip, um, if you're out and about, then you've got to hack it. If you're at home and you don't want to buy a chain whip because they're not they're not expensive, you could buy a really cheap one for probably seven or eight bucks. You buy a decent one that's going to last your lifetime, 20 bucks. Um, obviously, that's the better way to do it. But you could make one if you've got an old chain line around. We need is a bit of metal bar that's thin enough to go on the inside of the chain links. Drill three holes through. You have the short bit of chain. You have the longer bit of chain that whips around. Um, put that on just using a chain tool through the rivets. Um, as you would basically punch in the, um, the pin back through the, the chain even, not even rivets, don't know why I said that, uh, and something comfortable to wrap around the handle like some bar tape off a road bike. You can make one at home quite easily. And well, there's your solution. Anyone else got any hacks for getting a cassette off without a cassette tool? I'd love to know them actually, because that is probably one of the only parts on the bike, the same with the bottom bracket, you need a very specific tool for. Um, yeah, I'm interested to know. Let me know, I wanna know. Next up is from Damien Davids. Hey Doddy, would I lose any pedal efficiency if I were to swap out my 175mm cranks for shorter 170mm cranks? I'm on a full size 27 and a half and I tend to knock my pedals on technical climbs. Um, all the best. All right, so I hit my pedals all the time on technical climbs and I put up with it and I learned to ride differently. That's not to say you should because some people will tell you you should. It's up to you what you want. I don't think you'll notice too much difference, although I love the feel of a 175 crank and I can notice the difference going to a 170 from a 175. Admittedly, once you've ridden it for a while, I don't think there's that much difference in the way it feels. So chances are you could just adapt to it and it's gonna help you out that bit much. Um, as far as efficiency goes, I mean, I know that Henry likes to run much shorter cranks because he's got, I forget which hip it is, but one of his hips is a, he's got a bit of an old injury, a bit of a reoccurring injury, and the more he has to sort of extend his leg, the more it suffers, so he prefers a shorter crank. But I don't actually know much about the power 
transfer and how different it is. I'm sure a short crank isn't as good, but I'm willing to be proven wrong because I don't know for sure. So maybe when we're allowed back on the trails, uh, me and Henry will try it out for sure. We'll get power meters, we'll get cadence sensors and anything else out there, and we'll session a couple of hills to work out what, what actually is going on. If anyone knows for sure, love to know in the comments, but uh, I can't do anything for the moment for the moment because we're not really going out on the trails uh, given the situation we're in. But um, we'll find out as soon as lockdown is over. Next up is from the Spanner Chimp. I've got a 2019 Nuke Proof Scout race, uh, 290, and I'm thinking of maybe changing the tires primarily because my ride's getting longer, plus I'm doing a South Downs Way this year. Um, Dude, I hope you do get to do that with what's going on. Um, that's a really cool event to do. Um, I say event, a really cool thing to do in a day. Uh, I'm looking at maybe a faster rolling tire. Any recommendations? Where do you start? There's loads. It depends how lightweight and how fast you want to go because the obvious choice would be to go for a full XC tire, something like the one on screen. What you want to look for is as close to a central band as possible, especially for the rear tire. The reason for that is it just rolls that much faster. Even a heavier tire with a stickier rubber, if it's got central reach, it's gonna roll faster. Uh, obviously you want something with quite a low stack height. So we use Vittoria tires, so I would be inclined to say, if you're going for a cross country tire, look at something like, I don't know, I've got a Barzo over there, but no, I'd say the Mezcal would be the one. This is the Mezcal on the screen now. If you want a bit more of a trail tire, the Agaro is the one to go for. That's a low stack height and it's very similar actually. It's more like a modernized version of the Ardent or the Ardent Race by Maxxis. If you're going for a Maxxis tire, I'd definitely pick the Ardent Race out of those two. The knobs are even smaller, they're lower, they're quite well supported and it's got really good shoulders. Lightning fast out of tires, really good. Um, Schwalbe, what have they got? They've got the Racing Ralphs out there. Again, it all depends on how lightweight you're willing to go. That's up to you really. You might want to run an insert on the rear or at least a sort of the insert that enables you to ride soft. What I mean by that is if you get a puncture, if you slash the casing, you don't actually have to stop. You can keep rolling on for a while until you can fix it. Don't know. Any other suggestions out there for a super lightweight, fast rolling tire? I think the Icon is a fast one. Nino Scherzer uses those. I'm not too familiar with Schwalbe's these days. It's been a long time since I've used them. WTB have got quite a lot out there. In fact, you could arguably go for a gravel style tire if you really wanted to, if you wanted to go really fast, because uh, that's the order of the day these days, isn't it? Okay, next question is from Christoph. Which muck off chain lubes can you recommend, dry and wet? Because there's a lot of different ones. Are the ceramic ones any good? Well, it depends on the conditions you ride in. Uh, the two main ones, obviously, you get the bio wet and the bio dry lube. Uh, to be honest, they're the main ones I use in the winter. I'm going to use the wet lube, although I do prefer a dry lube. I don't mind having to put it on more often. Uh, the obvious difference between them, although they're both wet as a physical liquid, the wet stuff on a dry lube is just a carrier to get those lubricating bits inside the chain. On the wet lube, the whole thing stays wet. Wet, thick, congealed, um, really thick, viscous liquid. The idea of that is it's really water repellent and keeps that lube in place. Obviously, if you ran that in dry conditions, it's gonna be a right old mess as all the dirt and dust sticks to it. And essentially that's gonna turn into a grinding paste and weigh your chain down, which is why you wanna run a dry lube. The ceramic ones cost a bit more and they basically have ceramic particles in. And of course, you know, ceramic is super hard wearing. So basically the lube just lasts a lot longer. You pay more, but it lasts longer. So the trade-off is up to you. It depends what you wanna spend your money on in the first place. So there's a few shots of them on the screen here. Now the ceramic ones, as far as I know, they've got something called boron nitride in them, which is an additional trait that makes them extremely low in friction. Really quite tech stuff, actually. Um, I might do a little bit of a test between all the different styles of chain lube out there, because there's a lot of different ones. They've got their hydrodynamic lubes as well, or that's more road focused. Uh, you could probably get away with it in dry conditions off-road though, I reckon. But um, I'm gonna throw on screen to you something you'll probably find more useful than me just talking about these, is there's a bit of a, a page on the Muckoff website, actually, and it takes you through all the different types of lubes, what they do, and help you select the one that works for you. But um, ceramics do work, but I'm quite happy using the bio stuff, each to their own. Okay, last up is a fork travel option. Okay, so this is from Sasolik85. Hi, would it be worth upgrading from a Fox 34 150 mil travel to a Fox 36 with 170 mil of travel on my 2019 Scott Genius? Well, recently I upgraded my Fox 36 from 140 mil travel to 150 and the rear end of the bike is 130, and it feels amazing. It makes the bike feel a bit burlier, which it sounds like that's what you want to do with yours. 
Now the Fox 34 is an amazing fork, it's really good, but the 36, that's another level when it comes to charging into the rough stuff. And if you want to run 170 mil travel, you need the Fox 36. And I think that is the answer to your question right there. Uh, you want that big bully boy fork on the front, so go and get it and have a good time with it. It's an amazing piece of kit, but don't rush the setup on it. Fox suspension can take a little longer to find your sweet spot. The recommended base settings are good, but they're obviously not for everyone, so you do need to kind of figure that out. Uh, when setting up suspension, in fact, this is kind of a good topic. Uh, interested to know what other people out there think. Do you set up how you feel or do you set up from base settings? Definitely keen to know on that one because after all these years, I still every now and then don't use the manufacturer's base settings. I'll still go to my setting first and if it doesn't feel the way I want it to, I'll check what the base is for my weight. Uh, so I'm kind of curious to see what other people do with that. And um, well, would anyone else out there upgrade to a much bigger fork than they have? Let us know in those comments and we'll pick it up next time. As always, thanks for hanging around. Love you guys so much. Cheers.